Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here at the Whitney. Um, and it's my pleasure and also an honor to introduce tonight's program, Taino Today, Art and Culture in the Caribbean. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are here on unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape. As the Whitney is a museum devoted to expanding and complicating the category of American art, I hope this acknowledgement can help us think about that endeavor in a new way. This is also the work of the exhibition Pacha Yakta Wasichai, Indigenous Space, Modern Architecture, New Art, which is the occasion for tonight's program. More specifically, it was Jorge Gonzalez, one of the seven artists in the show, who instigated this conversation. In his practice, Jorge draws inspiration from Puerto Rican vernacular traditions, modernist architecture, and Taino art and cultural expressions. Here at the Whitney, he has created a site-specific installation titled Ayacabo Huarocoel, um, and I think that he will talk more about the piece tonight, so I won't say too much, um, except to say thank you, Jorge, for this piece and for bringing us all together. Um, so I'm going to hand things over very quickly here to my colleague, Marcela Guerrero, who is uh, going to moderate the conversation, and also she'll introduce our speakers. Um, but I'll introduce Marcela first. And it, she's an assistant curator here at the Whitney, and she organized Pacha Yakta Wasichai, with assistance from Alana Hernandez. Before Marcela joined the Whitney last spring, she was a curatorial fellow at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, where she helped organize the exhibition Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985, which is currently on view at the Brooklyn Museum and through this weekend, so I'm plugging that for her as well here. Um, and the museum, just one last note, that the museum is open until 10 o'clock tonight, so if you haven't yet had a chance to see the absolutely extraordinary Pacha Yakta Wasichai, you should go see it after the program. Um, so please join me in welcoming Marcella and our speakers. So welcome everyone. Thanks for being um, today, this lovely evening. Um, I think it's also first in terms of um, how many Caribbean people we have on stage. And this might be the first time that we have three Caribbean countries represented at the Whitney. Um, yeah, so I wanna introduce the speakers today, the people in here in, in, on the panel. Um, to my right, I have Dr. Jose Barreiro. He's a scholar emeritus at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, he was formerly assistant director for research and director um, in the office for Latin American Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. He's um, a member of the Taino Nation of the Antilles. Uh, Barreiro is a pioneering figure in Native American journalism and publishing. He co-edited with Dr. John Mohawk the National Native Journal Aquasasni Notes um, from 1975 to 1984. In 84, he co-founded co the Native American Journalist Association. At Cornell University from 84 to 2002, he served as associate director and editor-in-chief of Aquicon Press and the journal Native Americas. His program at Aquicon developed communications and community development networks among indigenous peoples in the, of the Americas. Um, uh, Dr. Barreiro leads uh, the Caribbean Indigenous Legacies Project, right, still, um, which conducts research on representational activities with Caribbean indigenous uh, communities, scholars, and policymakers. In 2015, he inaugurated uh, the NMAI exhibition and published the uh, catalog titled The Great Inca Road, Engineering an Empire. Jose Barreiro's other titles on American Indian topics include Thinking in Indian and John Mohawk Reader in 2011, America is Indian Country 2006, and Panchito Mountain Cacique 2001. Um, we also have Jorge uh, Baracuti Estevez. He is a research assistant and project member at the National Museum of the American Indian in New York. Estevez gives dozens of presentations about the Taino and their culture each year to school groups in the state of New York and abroad as a special lecturer, including a visit to the Dominican Republic in 2003 and probably more recently than that. 
um, to address an educational conference on indigenous revival. He is a frequent contributor to the Smithsonian Museum's magazine and has written for Native Peoples, as well as for the Encyclop Encyclopedia of Caribbean Religions. He is also an editor with the Caribbean Amer Amerindian Central Centralink um, and a member of the editorial board of Casica, the Journal of Caribbean Amerindian History and Anthropology. And in October, he's about to retire. So this is going to be um, in the past. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then lastly, we have Jorge Gonzalez. He received a BFA from the Escuela de Artes Plásticas in San Juan. And he was a fellow of San Juan's post-academic program, La Práctica, which is part of Beta Local from 2012 to 2014. Um, in summer 2016, Gonzalez was commissioned for a project for uh, much wider than a line at Sight Lines um, uh, Santa Fe. Um, through the production of artisanal banquetas chéveres. He worked with traditional Puerto Rican craftsmen and small workshops, as well as collaborators from the Escuela de Oficios, and he'll probably talk a little bit more about that, uh, to perform an aula reading at the University of Puerto Rico. Within this pedagogical platform initiated by Gonzalez, particularly, uh, particular manifestations of different scales and times weave an ongoing creation of a collective learning space. Um, I'm going to go to his recent participations. In 2015, as part of Beta Local's residency at ISCP, Gonzalez was invited to New York for a presentation of, on his practice. Um, he has exhibited internationally, including Art Rio in 2012, curated by Pablo León de la Barra and Julieta González um, at the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, DIAC, maybe I'm not pronouncing that correctly, in Chile, um, and also in Germany and in Sightlines Sight Lines Santa Fe. And in the spring 2017, he was part of the Davidoff Residency Program in Bogotá. Um, and he'll say a little bit more about what he's currently doing at the Clemente Sotoveles Center um, here in New York. Um, so with that, I want to start the evening talking with Jose about his research, um, especially in Cuba, and um, kind of what the, the state of the field is in terms, in terms of Taino culture and identity um, through the research that you've done in the case of, of Cuba. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here. Good turnout. Seems like the topic is getting some traction. Um, I had my, uh, some of my professional introduction uh, given. I uh, had uh, a very lucky life to be able to land in the right place at the right time. Uh, a few more times than most people have a right to. So. Um, I, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself as I begin. This is where I'm from, and the red there is Camagüey, Cuba, where I was born and where I spent uh, uh, my childhood. Uh, my folks are uh, largely from families that are called Guajiro in Camagüey. This is the people of the land, often described as um, white peasantry. But in fact, uh, that it's part of that whitewashing of the of the indigenous out of uh, all of us. Uh, some of my folks, my, great, my grandfather on the right, great-grandfather on the top, grandmother, second, third grandfather that uh, came along, uh, gives you a sense of the people I come from. Uh, uh, over, over, over the years, um, I really cut my teeth uh, in movement. I um, had uh, uh, luck, I guess, uh, in life to be uh, at the right place at the right time. Like I said, some people call me the Forrest Gump of the Indian movement. I seem to show up, get invited to things. Uh, <laughs> so uh, early on, uh, I uh, met some uh, Indian people in Minneapolis from the Ojibwe and uh, Sioux people and uh, began to get involved in my teenage years uh, in the American Indian movement and uh, more exactly the traditional Indian movement. 
uh, AIM has its own organizational history. The traditional movement is that uh, awakening of indigenous people across the Americas uh, through about uh, halfway through the 20th century to claim the right to exist. Uh, I think uh, academia generally, the, the disciplines that study native peoples were predicated almost 100% on the notion of an expectation of, of extinction. Everything was predicated on that idea. We have to save whatever we can because they're going to disappear. Because native people disappear the moment that they marry somebody else, someone <coughs> else, the moment there's mestizaje, that purity begins to drain and disappear. That was the notion that was carried. Or they changed, they began to wear pants, or they began to eat with plates, or they uh, adapted to the horse. And what's more Indian than the horse in the American mythology? But uh, in fact, all these things were adapted in just like marriage was adapted in. If there's a trunk of family, if there's a community, things survive, even though a woman may marry a man from the outside, a man may marry uh, elsewhere, but when people come into the, the fold, they're part of the community, and their children are already there. So that's a notion that anthropology seems not to work with very well. These are photographs from the Geneva Conference in 1977, and the indigenous people of the Americas said, not extinction, survival. So suddenly, probably 20 years before this, it began to turn the expectation of survival, not the expectation of extinction. And that's a different science. One is collecting knowledge, things, objects. The other one is, what do the people need? Who are they? What can help strengthen the identity of a people of land, of a people of a place, the people with ecosystemic culture. <clears throat> uh, oh, here's some more, some more of my folks. I don't know, I got this turned around. Well, the National Museum of the American Indian recruited me in 2006 to help form the Latin American department there. And uh, I have to say that it's a, it's a major piece of this move to recognition of community, living community. The museum was predicated on that idea. It brought forth the notion that, uh, that uh, uh, extinction was not there, and in fact, we needed to work with the communities about the archeological pieces, about events, uh, anything that had to do with their people. They had a right to comment on who they were. They weren't just the academics commenting people. So I like that at the, uh, the museum. Like I said, my personal inclination was that way. And because of this, this is my relative still in Kamaway, Cuba. <clears throat> we grew up with the notion, the symbologies of the indigenous, even though people didn't recognize it. I like to tell Cubans, when you call yourself Cubano, you're speaking Taino. Your country is named in Taino. Your identity forges in Taino. How can you say that it's extinct? Atue, our first hero from the area now, Haiti, Dominican Republic, came to Cuba, fought the Spanish, was uh, burned to death as a result. But he left a message. He left a message. He said, their only religion is gold. And don't give up your religion. When he was being burned to death, they asked him to convert. And he said, where did the Spanish go? And they said, they go to heaven. I said, well, then I want to go to hell. I don't want to be with such cruel people. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not indicting the Spanish of today, but I am indicting <laughs> the Spanish of that moment. <laughs> Going further east, we get to the tip of the Cuban Cayman, El Osico del Caimán. And here you see Guantanamo in the center, Manuel Tames, this whole area, all those mountains. There are indigenous people. There are communities of Cuban Indios that were marginalized and forgotten. Here we go again. Press it again, the bottom one. <clears throat> so it happened that at the end of the colony, at the beginning of the colony, I should say, really, 1550 or so, the Spanish abolished the encomienda in the Caribbean. Supposedly, uh, everything would change, but it took another decade before the Indian people began to get their freedom, be able to settle. 
and many settled in these pueblos de indios, one of them being El Caney, San Luis de los Caneyes, near Santiago de Cuba, where a, a, a large group of families survived with an Indian jurisdiction, not just Indian families here and there, an Indian jurisdiction akin to a reservation until 1850, 300 years after the supposed extinction, El Caney was already there. The revolution, I'm going to jump a little bit historically here, the beginning of the revolution, <clears throat> the rebel troops had fought in those mountains. Many of these people had joined, mm -hmm. as they had the independence wars before. So this is a memorandum <clears throat> that I was able to obtain in 1965 of the order to go study the native people in those mountains. And so officially, the revolutionary government asked Manuel Rivero de la Calle, a Cuban anthropologist, to uh, go and see what was there. He did. <clears throat> He's a very good man, Manuel Rivero, but with an antiquated science, physical anthropology, to measure, to weigh, to see the straight hair, to see how high the cheekbones were, this kind of thing. It's objectionable, but it was helpful because it gave the first blow to the idea of extinction. Rivero de la Calle filed his reports in, uh, in Havana, and uh, uh, they were shelved. They w didn't, it didn't seem uh, important enough to create any history around this, even to the revolution, ostensibly uh, of that mindset about people. So this is what, um, what was done, and then it was shelved. So people it never made it into the curriculum, and never made it into the history books for many years. We got wind of that. This is a, another piece of the story. This is Ladislao Ramirez Rojas, who, as an old man, let, he lived to 105, was here talking with Rivero, a young Rivero de la Calle. He was a uh, cacique, actual cacique, of the community of Caridad de los Indios. Not because somebody said, hey, your name is going to be cacique, but because there was a tradition of caciques. And he inherits his title from this man, his great uncle, Ladislao Ramirez, who was a veteran of the War of Independence. And through Ladislao, and through that history, we come to find out that uh, the, there was a regiment under Antonio Maceo, the great black general of, of, of Cuban independence, called the Atuay Regiment, uh, composed of people from Yateras and the Indian communities. And these were the fighters who composed that regiment that fought valiantly during the War of Independence uh, 1895. There was a, a group uh, at the beginning of the war that had been recruited by the Spanish. They gave a pretty good, strong blow to the revolutionary cause at the time. And Jose Marti, the famous Cuban poet and revolutionary, as well as uh, Jose Maceo, the brother of Antonio, made a serious um, uh, intent to recruit the Indians, to go remind them who they were. There's a beautiful story about a uh, uh, midwife who goes into trance all night and receives messages from the ancient caciques and the people waiting for that uh, got the word of what uh, was required of them. And they had uh, plenty of antagonism with the Spanish uh, regiment. So, uh, by morning, all of the Indian troops, hundreds, had passed over to the Atue Regiment. <clears throat> Through the uh, 20th century, you had a few uh, efforts. Uh, on, the, on the right is uh, Rivera de la Calle, uh, a story about him in one of the Cuban newspapers. Again, an epitaph for the Amerindians of Cuba. The expectation of extinction was still very strong. On the left, we have work by Antonio Nunez Jimenez, who was a captain uh, in the rebel army and uh, very, uh, very important uh, to the final battles against uh, the dictator Batista at that time, but who as a young man had gone into those mountains and met the folks. And he wrote about them. So you had now a strong revolutionary figure that knew the reality of that, just like it's known in the region, but not nationally. So just to show you that there's a history of research <clears throat> we met Panchito in 1995. From the moment he became cacique here on the left, uh, 
1985, he began to go out to dance uh, events, uh, cultural events, trying to represent his people, and began to gain some ground. One time he was actually arrested for impersonating an Indian. Uh, his people went and got him. <laughs> they got him out of jail very quickly, about 300 of them. So you don't mess with Panchito. <coughs> Uh, he's a wonderful man, just loving, compassionate, incredible knowledge of everything. Every little insect in his whole comarca, he knows everything. Where the water holes are, where, the, where everything, what grows here, what doesn't grow here, what comes through here. So that's what makes him cacique. He says cacique has to be the moral authority, not a bossy person, and you have to know it all. Yeah, so the people come to you. On the right, since that effort was being made by him, there came a moment, and uh, you can't read the sign very well, but it says, Comunidad Autóctona, La Rancheria. It's the only autochthonous community recognized in Cuba. There are more. <clears throat> this is part of our early, an early map, research map of our study that uh, identified 22 communities in those mountains and in some of the barrios around, around cities. And there's actually more. There's probably another 10 or 12 more that we haven't uh, completely worked with. Reina, <clears throat> not cacique, but the heart of the community. She's the heart of everything. The, the, every day starts that way. Reina is the first one with the coffee. All the campesinos come by, they drink their coffee, and they go out to their fields. So there's a kind of family cohesion mm -hmm. that comes from the strong uh, elderly, uh, elder women. Um, the elders, again, very important in the community. On the right, you see a very interesting case because there has been some, some um, uh, notion that the Taino movement is somehow um, uh, destructive or negative of black culture or Afro-Cuban culture. And it's just not true. The communities get along real well. This is a Haitian woman from a very strong Haitian community who is a curandera. She came over and she took their niece, who was ailing with a horrible skin disease, and with her own herbal uh, regimen, cured her. So that, that uh, uh, brotherhood or sisterhood between the communities is there. <clears throat> Panchito asked us uh, to um, help them get known so that the idea of extinction would go past. He asked us to help him reweave his families because they had scattered all over. Oriente, during the special period after the fall of the Soviet Union, the conditions in those mountains really deteriorated, medical and so forth, so roads. So many of the families with young children look for other conditions, <coughs> but they keep in touch. And this is that baptism, which is very interesting because, uh, well, a number of ceremonies that they, there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, material from herbal traditions, to uh, uh, many other natural world knowledge and ceremonial life that belongs to the community. Here's a baptism that's not Catholic, it's not evangelical, it's nothing like that. It's their own baptism. We mo moved around to the communities, uh, met the uh, elders wherever we went. They were full of stories of their childhood and who they were and their, their values and knowledge. Valores y saberes. This is where we've been concentrating. Valores y saberes, and there's a lot. Panchito had a chance with us to visit different families of his that hadn't seen him for a long time. They received him with open arms, of course. They all love him. And they love their trunk. They love their base. So, give you a sense of some of the work. <clears throat> Other families, this is near Olguin, Bariay, also a uh, large group of families there. The Cane community that I was mentioning <clears throat> before um, lost its jurisdiction in 1850. New colonists began to move into the area, and so the Indian families were pushed further and further up the mountains. So they ended up in places called like Caridad de los Indios, El Escondite de Indios, the hiding place of the Indians, La Escondida, etc. And that's where they ended up. Here we visit Hiwani, another one of those early Spanish towns where there's still descendants, descendant families, and they want to gather. Large group of Hiwani, these kind of events is happening more and more, the myth of extinction, the theoretic uh, events. 
And you find things like this. This is niche tamalization. This is the ancient 4,000-year-old American practice of washing the hull of the dry corn using hardwood ashes. I was walking through their village one day, and somebody said, hey, somebody's cooking with mud. I said, really? Over there? No. She's using the same methods that Mohawks use today, that the Mexicans use, that the Mayas use. It's a whole methodology of how to clean the dry corn that can last forever in storage. So here's a method, 4,000 years old, in a supposed extinction mm -hmm. context, right there, happening. The Makuyu ceremony, the ceremony of the tobacco that Panchito runs. Four directions, smoke to the four directions, and then an appreciation of La Madre Tierra, the Padre Sol, the moon, the stars, wind, water, major elements of the human being to survive. Macuyo, which no linguist in Cuba had heard of, but they certified it was a Taino, it is a Taino word. It's, it was, it's what they call the cigar, the lit cigar. Mm -hmm. Part of that baptism begins. Sobar, a tradition of spiritual massage. Uh, very, very common, you see it uh, everywhere. You see it around Cuba generally, but very concentrated here. It's very interesting that all the mythologies and different work that was done in Cuba in the 19th century and most of the 20th century that are supposed to have disappeared. The stories of the Hiwi, the little people, the stories of the Kawedos, the shapeshifters, the Siwapa, mm. the, 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 the woods uh, woman that, uh, that uh, traps men and, 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 and uh, leads people sometimes. All those uh, traditions are alive in, in these communities. People talk about the, the heatway of that uh, mud hole and why, well, we've seen him, we know him, we didn't even know his name. So uh, the, the, fabula, the fabulosity, I call it, the, mm -hmm. the fabulousness <clears throat> uh, is there, the cohesion mm -hmm. of thinking. Here's a uh, planting by the moon cycles uh, uh, workshop. Incredible uh, knowledge that comes out of very specific cropping systems. The cutara is not being worn anymore the ancient uh, footwear, but there's still, just in this uh, two communities, five people who still know how to make them. So we're trying to uh, encourage that, to revitalize how it is, the ecosystemics of the Kutara. Elder women leaders, very strong herbalists, dream healers, Reina on the, on the left and Reina on the right, Reina Mongo and Reina Rojas. Uh, 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 Mongo, Reina Mongo, tremendous herbalist. Reina uh, Rojas, a incredible dreamer. Can dream exactly where the herb is that this person needs. Just goes, goes to sleep and she gets there. So these things, I'm saying, after 60 years of supposed uh, um, uh, revolution, I guess, or supposed uh, um, uh, scientific base, uh, these things exist. Jose, sorry, you were mentioning before that um, they also <laughs> teach the children and the children can identify um, yeah, several in, of the different herbs. In, uh, in, in, in one community, we uh, uh, did a um, workshop uh, uh, to see who would know most about herbs. They wanted to have a competition. So there was uh, children under 12, women, and men. And... Uh, the men won, but they have Panchito. So the, even the women said, you cheated. You have to take Panchito out. You, you can't be there. So, but they won by two or three. But the young people under 12 had 40 some herbs, 43 herbs. How do, you, how do you young guys know as much as this? Well, who do you think goes to the forest to pick the herbs for, for every time they need something, they send me to get it. You know? And if we bring the wrong one, we really get in trouble. You know? So that's all that oral tradition that sustains. Mm -hmm. Finally, he emerges. You know, we have uh, a, a, a process uh, that went through, and this is uh, very important because this is a Casa de las Americas in Havana, the Cuban Intellectual Center for the Hemisphere and Publishing Center, uh, in a conference of indigenous delegates pre in preparation for the United Nations meeting that happens here. This is year before, this is 2014, in preparation for the, the meeting here of permanent forum. In, uh, Idalis, uh, Panchito's daughter, we asked him one time, Panchito, when you go, who's going to replace you? 
you have about 20 kids, which one? And he says, well, this one he knows about 60%. This one he knows about 80%. This one doesn't know much. But Idalis, she's 130%. She's got it. And she's a dream healer like her mother. Some of the delegates, uh, Panchito coming out in forums, speaking. He's, he's a very simple man. He's illiterate or pre-literate, perhaps, but very bright. Small exhibitions that began to, uh, to emerge occasionally with their topic. Here she's, he's talking to the director of uh, um, Natural Medicines Institute of Cuba that's uh, developed all kinds of medicines. She was fascinated at his description of herb after herb, remedy after remedy that he knows. So that's what we found there, and we find that it's not just La Rancheria. Um, there are people all over those mountains. We find, too, that 35% of the Cuban general population has mitochondrial DNA Taino. The woman's line uh, is Taino, 35%. In the whole country, in the eastern part, 58, 60%. So DNA doesn't prove identity, but it sure gives us an indication of what survives and what doesn't survive. Uh, it's seen also in the tremendous vocabulary of Taino inside of Cuban Spanish. The linguists tell us this had to happen over 300 years. This couldn't have happened over 50 years. Yeah. So the, the, the research is showing more and more a continuity of uh, genetics, but also continuity of culture. And some of that culture has spread to other campesino communities that don't claim an indigenous base. Like these guys, these are the famous tobacco makers from, uh, from Pinar del Rio. Panchito blew them away. When he, when he did this, his oration of the Mother Earth, they said, we believe that. We just didn't know how to say it. We believe that, of course, he says to them then. Where's the heart of your field? ¿Dónde está el corazón de la vega? Oh, it must be the center. He says, no, let's go find it. And he and Idalis did a whole walkabout, walkabout, and they found the spot. He says, you burn here, you do your ceremony here, this tobacco is going to be the best there is. I didn't go back to see if it was, in fact, the best, but <laughs> that's what he told them, and they believed him. Uh, the uh, seal of El Cane that community that I mentioned. And now the new work that we have going now, which is the larger workshops. It's the gathering now of the 20 some communities. And people are coming out from the various communities to talk about their saberes and their valores. Mm -hmm. And we keep it that way. The government, which was very reluctant initially to look at this direction, is finally opened up. It finally says, yes, we have something here. This is real. And so we're in good condition with the academics, sometimes worse the academics, and then the government officials, knowing that something is happening. Cuba, like most places, is beset by new values coming in, new methodologies as a result of globalization, the, um, the diminishment of identity in the land, in yourself, in your families, uh, and uh, this is the opposite of that. This is localization. This is looking at the indigeneity of place. And Cuba and Puerto Rico, which are two wings of the same bird, had a very interesting experience. In Cuba, in 89, the Soviets collapsed after 40 years of dependency on the Soviet system. There was a true revolution in Cuba, hardworking people. Most people supported the revolution and, and throughout. Uh, but uh, they made one mistake, a serious mistake. I won't say just one, perhaps, but a serious mistake. They pushed down the Cuban knowledge of agriculture and pulled up the scientific uh, agriculture, the large state farms, the huge machinery, the Petroleum-based agriculture was introduced heavily in Cuba. Suddenly, in 89, the Soviets collapsed. And Cuba, one of the few countries, I think perhaps the only one in the hemisphere, certainly, experiences, in one month to the next, a 95% reduction in petrol. 
I traveled through Cuba in 95 when I went to meet Panchito. If I saw 30 cars moving, it was a lot. Nothing moved. They went back to zero. They called it uh, zero moment. Mm. And what saves the country from starvation? Because there was a lot of hunger during those days because the Soviets stopped providing everything. The old Taino crops, yuca, ñame, malanga, uh, frijol, maíz. This is what came up. Within six, eight months, people were producing in their bathtubs. They were producing everywhere because the country went down. And they experienced the reality of what they had. They had forgotten as a country. They were beginning to forget what wonderful knowledge there is in the base communities, in the campesino communities. Mm -hmm. So this is part of what's coming back. And I think we've seen something akin in Puerto Rico with, with the hurricanes. Mm -hmm. People have had to go back to mm -hmm. do for themselves. It's a tough lesson. It's a, it's a tough lesson. But in, in, in those days when the world is changing, those old traditions of self-sufficiency, of no, knowing how to raise your own crops, uh, like Orrin Lyons, uh, the Seneca chief said, or Onondaga chief says, someday only those who plant will eat. Mm. So uh, we're coming to that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to give the clicker now to Jorge Estevez. But before, I wanted to um, also mention that Jorge and Jose are part of the curatorial team of an exhibition that's going to open next week on July 28th at the uh, NMAI National Museum of the American Indian here in New York, um, titled Taino, Native Heritage and Identity in the Caribbean. So um, that's one of the main reasons we wanted to bring them here and because they've been instrumental to Jorge's thinking. Um, and with that, uh, uh, Jorge E. is going to tell us a little bit about, also about his background, but also uh, mainly about the ideas and what will, you know, audiences and viewers will see at the exhibition. And then hopefully after that, we'll um, turn it to Jorge Gonzalez. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I, I love listening to Jose. Jose is... Um, my, my teacher, uh, I've learned, I think, more from Jose than anybody else um, uh, in my life. Um, so I really appreciate everything that, that you do. Um, he definitely proves Cuban extinction, Cuban techno extinction, right? Just kidding. <laughs> so. Um, that was in the Dominican Republic. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so you have a few more slides here, Jose. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> So I'm just going to begin a little by telling you a little bit of my story and my connection to the Museum of the American Indian. I, um, I came here in 1965 uh, during uh, the revolution that was taking place in the Dominican Republic. There was a military coup going on. And um, my mother, I, got, I, I had to stay behind. Um, and later on, my mother came to, to get me. Um, so we arrived in 1965. And this is my grandmother here, the one that's standing and the one that's sitting down right there. Um, my grandmother always asserted that we came from, um, from Indian people. And um, to the day she died, she, that, that, was, that was always her identity, and that's what she passed on to me. And um, I never questioned that. That's, that was my reality. Um, growing up, that's all, I, that's all I knew. Coming from the campo, we come from, from what we call un campo oscuro, which means uh, we come from a campo where there was very little electricity, um, uh, no running water. Um, so we had to be very self-sufficient, you know, as far as, you know, what we made. And one of the, the things that, that we made in my house was cassava bread. That's my connection to, to the Taino culture, um, is making cassava. I remember since I was, since I can remember, uh, since I was young, grating the yuca, um, squeezing out the poison and, and making um, um, cassava. Um, so when we moved to this country, we moved to a, to an old white neighborhood. Um, so we, we were kind of an oddity. I got called more names. Luckily, I couldn't understand what they were, they were telling me, but, but I got called names all the time. And, uh, but what really used to get to me was that when I was in school, the teachers always asked me, uh, where, where was I from? And some of them asked me if I, was, if, I was in, if I was Indian or whatever. And when I would tell them that I was in the Dominican, I would tell them yes. 
But uh, I would answer yes, but once I told them that I was in the Dominican Republic, they always made a point of telling me that that, would, that couldn't possibly be true because all the Indians in the Dominican Republic had, had, um, had all perished, you know. Um, and I would go home and, and, and speak to my mother about this. She claimed that the teachers don't know everything, um, <laughs> which sometimes is true. Um, but, um, but it really did bother me that there was this difference between what was being taught to me at home and what I was learning in school. So um, in 1972, I was 11 years old, we visited the Museum of the American Indian. At that time, the museum where I work at today was located in Uptown Manhattan, and, um, I think it's in uh, 155th Street. And um, I remember walking in to, to the museum, and um, as soon as I, because I, I, I really didn't know that we were going to an Indian museum, I knew we were going to visit a museum, so as soon as I saw all those objects, I just totally fell in love with the objects. And this is uh, the way the museum looked back then. These, a lot of these pictures are from 1960 and maybe even earlier than that. This was before the Smithsonian had taken over the, the, the exhibits, um, the, the, the museum. Um, and these exhibits never changed, really. They just would cram the, the, the cases with, with, with objects. I used to feel like the objects were kind of uh, suffocating in there. There was no life to it. It was really mm -hmm. dead. But I, but I was in love with, with all the objects, in particular, um, the ones from the Caribbean. There was one case similar to the one that you see here on top that said, that basically read the following. Oh, and by the way, the, the image that you see on the bottom, um, that is Deminan Caracaracol. Mm -hmm. He is a semi, the first one that I ever saw in real life, and he's basically been with me my whole entire life in the museum. We have him um, um, uh, displayed now, and he's been with me uh, my entire life. Um, the, the case that I'm speaking about basically read this. It said West Indies, the Taino, the Taino Indians. And then it said, sadly, by 1450, um, 1545, every single Taino had perished forever. Some historians describe this event as a, as a genocide. And that shook me because when I first went into the museum, I thought that, well, this is going to finally prove who I am, you know, somehow. And I was just 11 years old. And then, then this is the message that it, that it, that it read, you know, that I read. And, um, and I was quite shocked by that, but, um, but I remember feeling that that, 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 that was gonna change one day, you know? And even my, like I would speak to my mother about it and she would tell me, algún día la cosa cambia, tu verá. So um, my life took a lot of different twists and turns. Um, I don't know why or how I got to the museum exactly, but about 25 years ago, I actually began um, working at, at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, after this, I had moved on time. I started as a, as a volunteer. And, um, and I remembered my childhood memories and, 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 and everything. And, um, and uh, I'm sorry. I think some of the, the slides got switched around a bit. But I remember you know, some, of my, some of the memories that I had from, from being young and, and, and the frustrations that I felt uh, about my identity and, and how it was always questioned. And I, I wanted to find a way to be able to, to prove it, uh, to prove that who, who I was, and not only to, to others, but to myself. So um, when I began working at the museum, I was, I've been there for 25 years now. Um, I worked at, in the education department, and um, basically my job was bringing other Native people from across the Western Hemisphere to do public programs at the museum. And um, I, I brought in people all the way from Alaska to, from, to the tip of South America, and I learned a lot from them, and, uh, and I also got to tell them my story. Um, in 2002, Jose came to the museum to do a program for me. This is before Jose started working at the museum. And um, he was just about, he was working on work, uh, getting to a job at the museum. And he told me, George, when I get to the museum, eventually we're gonna put up an exhibit, you know? And I got excited because I always uh, admired and respected Jose, but I said, if Jose is here, you know, knowing how he does his things, we're gonna get an exhibit up at the, at, at the museum. And sure enough, um, we ended up working on, a, uh, on an exhibit. Um, the exhibit <clears throat> um, was also put together by the Latino Center, but this over here is the team, it's Jose Barreiro, Rosmaria Esteves, Ita Vidauri, myself, uh, uh, Antonio Curret, and from the Latino Center, Eduardo Diaz, Ronald Wollman, and Cristina Gonzalez. Um, but we had another exhibit, this thing, like I said, it got kind of fl flipped around. Before Jose came to work at the museum, we had put up, we had launched another exhibit. It was, 
not an ethnographic exhibit, it wasn't a cultural, it was more a photographic exhibit. But it was the first time that the museum took a real look at, at Tainos and, you know, and said, you know, there is something here, you know. Um, this, was, um, um, this exhibit was put together by a woman called Marisol Villanueva from Puerto Rico. And she basically visited all the Caribbean islands looking at the indigeneity of the place and she could see that there was a culture that was there that wasn't really being spoken about. That wasn't, it was never highlighted. It was campesino culture and it was indigenous. So a lot of these pictures that you see here, um, you see um, pictures of Panchito and his family, some from the Dominican Republic, um, et cetera, et cetera. There was about some 60 or 70, 70 um, um, pictures. But the exhibit didn't go far enough. You know, um, At the end it was more, um, a photographic exhibit, it wasn't really something that, that you can sink your teeth into. So it was a little frustrating. Um, and then in 2011, uh, Jose put together this team, um, which is the Caribbean Indigenous Legacies Project. And this is the, the first, the, um, the first um, part of it. Uh, um, so it, it, revolved, it revolved around having distinct tanks about about you know, like how could we best present um, this subject uh, of Taino, um, of Taino uh, extinction, and and and, and to, you know to basically show what's there. Uh, you know, when when you come from a place like like um, like for myself from the Dominican Republic, and you know what the indigenous culture is, you see it everywhere. You know, but it, somehow the the anthropologists and the archaeologists that are there, uh, it sometimes feels like they have an agenda because. They don't focus on, on this campesino culture that's very rich. And um, so we were looking at, at certain aspects of this. We had uh, uh, these roundtable discussions and also uh, um, a symposium afterward. And we went again in 2012. Um, this time it, it expanded and we brought in a lot of experts from across the Caribbean, which is very nice, and also taking a look at, at the exhibit. And, um, and then we set out to do our field research for this. So these were the, the aims of, um, that we had was uh, researching the research areas included agricultural traditions, spirituality and medicines, community, family, oral traditions, maroon, mestizaje, uh, community dynamics, material, cultural language, DNA, ancestry, and identities uh, and customs. And this was a, a, a postcard that we, that we uh, had over here. So in Puerto Rico, uh, Jose was the one uh, who went to Puerto Rico. And um, the Taino movement was born in, in, in New York, basically. And um, I'm, I'm one of the, the architects of that. And basically what happened was that Taino people started getting together uh, at powwows. You know, you would go to powwows and you would see other people that were, that were like yourself that were searching for, for an identity, I guess. Or a lot of times, you know, you go to a powwow and and you meet other Indian people, they, you know, they, they would recognize you as Indian, you know. And so slowly we started getting together, and, um, and then this movement started growing. Um, and it grew rather quickly at, then. This was in, uh, like, 1990, you know, 1989. Um, that's when I first um, uh, came to it. From here, it started picking up um, a lot of steam. Some of the, the pictures didn't transfer over when we did this, but I wanted to show you how it went from that first room there to a full-fledged Taino movement. Um, at this time, I remember that when we used to, we used to go to powwows, um, the, the North American Indians used to look at us with curiosity because um, you know, here we are, you know, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans saying that we were Indians. So a lot of times, you, know, you could hear them saying, and they would say things like, um, oh, here comes these damn Puerto Ricans saying that they're Indians. You know? And, uh, but we kept on going and kept on participating. And then later on, you would hear them saying, oh, here come these damn Tainos. And, and I knew that we were, we were getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, got, I, got, I was lucky enough to go to Jamaica. And you, would, you wouldn't believe that even in a place like Jamaica, where you don't expect to find so much indigeneity, it, it's everywhere. Jamaica has um, a lot of uh, maroon communities. These maroon communities are um, slaves that escaped into the mountains where, um, fighting the British. And a lot of them have a Native American ancestry, a Taino ancestry. And they know it, you know, and they tell you clearly that they, they know, they see themselves as African, but they also say we're also Arawak or Taino. And, and they, 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 they say it proudly. 
Um, while I was there, I got, to, I got to look at their culture, and I see things like this, this thing here is called jackass rope, which is very similar to something that we have in the Dominican Republic called anduyo, which is compressed tobacco. It's an indigenous, an indigenous um, uh, custom. Um, and the, the picture next to it is from a community um, that's called um, Pedro Bluffs. And that old man um, is in our archives as a, as, a, as a Taino descendant in 1892. So I visited that community, and, uh, and I, we found a lot of people there that looked very much Puerto Rican or Cuban or Dominican, you know, and they also said, yeah, we, we know that we are um, of Taino ancestry. So um, Jamaica was amazing for me um, because it, it, even myself, I knew that I was going to find a lot of indigeneity there, but to the level that I found it was amazing. They, they also um, do a lot of cassava bread and have a lot of um, products like that. The Dominican Republic um, was uh, a place that I've been very familiar with, and my, my job in the Dominican Republic was looking for, um, for tamani. Tamani is a spirituality that exists in, uh, in one particular region where it's strongest. It's known as Agua Dulce, and it's part of a religion. Uh, of a religion, there's a, basically in this area there are three religions, and one of them is called Ventiun División. The Ventiun División um, is divided in in three. Um, part of it is African. It's heavily African. It has a minor of Indian, and then it has a, a, a lot of um, Catholicism within it. Um, their altars are very interesting because they place statues of Africans and Indians and pictures of saints all on one, on one uh, altar. Um, there's another religion that's called Liborista. The Liboristas are um, very Catholic, but also heavily Indian in their traditions. But their Indian traditions are very different than the ones from Bentium Division. Um, and they also have um, some African. And, in that, and their altars are very interesting too because they have, in their altars they have a lot of Catholic imagery, some African, but the Indian is never placed together with the, um, with the other two. They claim that the Indian spirits do not like to work with Africans or with, uh, or with um, the Spanish because they both, both those, these, other, these, these two other religions, um, both of these religions, they work with blood and metal and that is somehow a, a taboo. So they place um, the Indian part on the ground, usually behind um, the, the, the altar or or in caves, uh, deep in caves, and, but always has to be underground. And then I questioned that and I said, there must be, you know, if this is truly an Indian, an Indian uh, um, a Taino continuity, spiritual continuity, there must be people that practice just Tamani, just, uh, just the sweet water religion. And sure enough, I started locating people, um, usually secondhand knowledge, until I finally met people that, uh, that were actually practitioners, and, uh, and that blew me away because these people um, only practice the, the indigenous part of it, and it gets really, really intense. Um, if you look at this picture over here, that is a celebration that they do uh, inside of a cave, and thousands and thousands of people go um, to that cave to celebrate Anacaona. Anacaona was a, a female chief of, of the island, but she has become a tabe. Uh, in a sense, you know, because all the attributes that you find of Atabe, which is the, the earth goddess of the Taino people, um, are, are attributed to, At, um, to uh, Anacaona as well. As a matter of fact, the people say that Anacaona, who is located, her spirit is supposed to be located in a place that's called Corral de los Indios. They say that she appears to you in, in human form, but she cannot leave that spot um, where, where this corral is. But when she does appear outside of the corral, she appears to you in the form of a crab. So a lot of the people in the area, they actually protect the water crabs because this is supposed to be the spirit of Anacaona. Um, uh, the, the religion also centers around um, water um, and stones. And the stones are said to be people that are said to talk to you and they also connect you to the Indian ancestors. People have communal stones like in this picture here. These stones are fed every day and they're watered every day. And that is a, that picture there, that is a, an altar, uh, an Agua Dulce altar. That's exactly how they, how they go. See that man over there on that side there? He's also um, feeding a stone. Um, this is um, the picture on top there on the right. That's Amantina. And she's holding a stone that 
the, that stone, she says, talks to her, and she sends it all over the world so that it could connect, collect um, its, um, energy from all over the world. And then um, up here in the center, in the top, that is a four-direction symbol that they make. They actually make seven. Each one of these symbols represents one of the, the sacred directions, and it works as a calendar. When they create this symbol, they create this symbol to raise up the sun. This is the way they wake up the sun every morning, and they do that with cornmeal. So, so there's a lot, a lot there, and this is just when it comes to um, spirituality. And then, of course, it's you know the fishing techniques and everything else. Is, uh, um, every other aspect of indigeneity is found there. The Dominican Republic is very similar to Cuba, except that we don't have as much documentation as Cuba does, and um, I'm hoping to eventually change that. Um, I'm not going to speak to you about Cuba because I think Jose did a pretty good job on Cuba already. So um, this is the, the opening uh, uh, of the exhibit. Uh, it's going to be on uh, July 28th. I hope you all could make it to the exhibit. Um, for me, this is, the, uh, this, is, this is great, you know, in the sense that I, I never thought that one day we would actually be opening up an exhibit on, on, on Taino. Taino survival, as you see in, in our magazine there, it says Taino survival. Um, but the museum did take an interest, you know. I think that it, when we had these, these roundtable discussions and we brought in all these, these experts from outside, I think that all of them could see that, um, I, I, right, a few of the people that came to, to our, to our roundtable discussions, a lot of them came there not believing that there was any, any, sur any survival of any kind or that there was any continuity. But, but in fact, they did, um, they went away knowing that there was something there and it's very strong. Um, and lastly, I want to show you this. This is a, uh, a study that was done recently. Uh, and this study was one that was based on, uh, see, when Jose was mentioning about the genetics of, of, of uh, Taino identity, um, when the historians, historians, let me just backtrack a little bit. Historians used to, especially in the Dominican Republic, historically they said uh, that there was not a single drop of indigenous blood in the Caribbean anywhere. That's what was always maintained. And if it was, it was, it was washed away. It couldn't possibly be significant in any way at all. When in the 1990s, they started doing mitochondrial DNA studies, it started in Puerto Rico, and 61% of the population ended up having this mitochondrial DNA Mitochondrial DNA is a DNA that's passed on through the woman's line, right? Um, that, that's outstanding, you know, to think like this, you go from nothing to 61%. Uh, it's disturbing. If you're a historian who's made his bones say, talking about extinction, wait a minute, now this is going to make you pause. So most historians, they quickly countered with, well, these are not Indians that are from the Caribbean. Because remember, Indians were brought as slaves from outside the Caribbean, right? But this was mitochondrial DNA. This was the female line, right? So the, the, the slaves that were being brought from outside the Caribbean to the islands were actually males. They weren't um, females. So that didn't really hold water. Um, and again, a lot of them said, well, you know, it, this can't be Caribbean. Um, and it's, it's very washed. It, it must be very washed, um, washed out anyway. Now, my, mitochondrial DNA is divided in what's called haplogroups. And the haplogroups are A, B, C, and D. These are the Native American haplogroups. Within the haplogroup, there's what's called the haplotype, and that, those are geographically specific. So the scientists already knew, the geneticists already knew that all the DNA that was being found in Cuba, Dominican Republic, and in, and in Puerto Rico was specific to the Caribbean. But in this particular study that's here, what happened was that they found a tooth in a skull in the Bahamas that was over a thousand years old, and it had a full strand of DNA, so they can compare it to modern day people, and once and for all, they were gonna answer the question, are modern day people from the Caribbean um, directly descended from the Tainos or not? And to their surprise, they, took, they, they matched it up with 160 Puerto Ricans, and it was a 100% match, you know? So that's the end of that argument, you know, <laughs> you, you would think, right? Um, I think that uh, the exhibit that we have coming up now, um, it's a great exhibit. Uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, I think we could have done better, um, but we could always do better. Uh, considering that this story is so close to my heart, close to a lot of people, uh, and uh, 
But, uh, but I think it opens up a dialogue for us to begin to have a real serious discussions. You know, before, when you bring up this subject, it's always um, seen as suspect, or that we have some kind of hidden agenda, that, that this is about uh, anti-blackness. It has nothing to do with that. It's, just, it's about acknowledging a, a reality, you know, that our ancestors didn't all perish, you know, that, that they actually survived and that we carry them with us. And that's what, we, oh. that's what we've done. We acknowledge that. Um, so um, hopefully you'll have some more questions for me and I can answer anything that you want. But that's it for me. Thank you. Jorge, I, I love that you presented your present, your presentation was um, grounded on at first going to a museum and not being able to see yourself and recognize yourself and then ending on a note of now you can. Um, and hopefully we can talk about how Jorge G's uh, installation here as part of uh, Pachayac Tawasichai um, also talks about presentation and not necessarily representation and how you know, that continuation, dissemination of knowledges that we are um, carrying out here in a way um, is presented through the different elements that you have in your, in Ayacao, Guaracoel, which I, I wanted to start by asking you, let's unpack that title in, yes, and, and you're, you're the expert, so. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, well, grateful for, for this occasion since, uh, since Jorge's and Jose's work has been very influential in, in the development of a practice that is inclusive of indigenous, indigenous elements within a cultural you know, examination of, of the Caribbean. Uh, um, so their investigation on Taino survival regarded material culture, as well as modes of making community which were uh, elements that I've had present in considering a design consciousness, no? uh, oriented towards m ways of making community, uh, providing an alternative to, to an education on, on the arts. And regarding those people in Puerto Rico that paved the way uh, to, to provide those, those alternatives uh, for pedagogy, no, uh, and also for 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 an evaluation, also on on on, on an economical way, no, on on, on providing an economy, no, and uh, examination that, that that had a design consciousness as well, as well, no, to 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 engage in a, in a, in in a in a in a consciousness of pro, of making a community. As a base, uh, as as that basis for 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 uh, uh, for yeah, for that design consciousness. So uh, so so. Um, or if you want, I want I can flip through the images. So I feel comfortable with this with okay. this image, no? This gathering that happened at the University of Puerto Rico behind the tower of the university where there's a, a cojoba tree planted mm -hmm. in front of, uh, of the bust of three modernist poets whose central figure was, uh, is uh, Luis Pales Matos, no? a conceiver of the Afro-Antillian poetry movement. And, uh, and side by side were two Spanish poets that migrated to, to Puerto Rico, Juan Ramón Jiménez and Pedro Salinas. And there, uh, and there we recognized this place, this sculptural garden no, behind the tower, where, where there was a recognition of, of an indigenous base. No? There's, and uh, this cojoba tree, I came to know because of, of consulting one of, 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 of the collection of the University of Puerto Rico, an herbarium, uh, and I could approach the tree and, and in, that, in, in that way, uh, organize, uh, organize a reading um, beneath the canopy of this tree and, and made a presentation of this project that, that, that it's, a, it's a dear project that has developed from, from, uh, from ways in which uh, the platform, a platf this platform for, for communicating this design process that, I, that, I'm, that I'm presenting to you, that I'm trying to sum up 
Uh, but uh, but yes, to to present this this project, no, so within this community that has supported uh, uh, this discussion on 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 an, an indigenous well, heritage, uh, those people that claim and their indigeneity that identify themselves as relearners and practitioners of a system of beliefs no here i'm regarding two persons that are present in this in this meeting uh, amanari uh, and robinson rosado those are the persons that are to to one corner to each of the corners and also uh uh, they have been strong supporters of, of, of providing an exchange on regarding this, uh, this in, that, that an indigenous community present well, among us. And, and so uh, the, this, these benches who, who, that were developed uh, together, that, that was developed together with a, with a hammock maker in the island, no? Uh, developed in conversations in reconstructing, in putting forth the reconstruction of a modernist design, uh, which was a, a, a chair made by, by Henry Klump, who is the person that I referred, that, that I referred to as, uh, as uh, the person who provided me this alternative for a design uh, education, which, uh, which displays no, an, uh, an education uh, an architectural education in, in his in his example no uh, that oriented towards professionalization no so he he was he he provided a trade school no as one who who could provide the necessary tools to engage in a process of design that had consciousness of of the worker uh, so those ideas res resonated uh, and uh, and became the alternative that I could provide to, to, to an art education and also to areas within the academical system that, uh, that are uh, like physically, you, there is a palpable ruin. For example, the house of the architect is a property of the University of Puerto Rico, of this architect, Henry Klum. It's a house of, of his house is property of the of the University of Puerto Rico and is in a ruinous condition. So in a way, I I, I believe that my work could orient well, well could provide well uh, uh, a reconstruction to to this space. Although it, it lives as a, well as a symbolical space, no the the alternative that I provide are en engage uh, are are put forth within within exhibition platforms are, as we are you know, currently well, developing. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity that, uh, that the installation that I've come to present in this exhibition serves as a support structure for, of meetings as we are having today. No? And, uh, and that we are in, in the development of, of them no? regarding uh, developing readings within the exhibition space. Uh, Jorge, one second. Can yes. you maybe talk a little bit about how this image, because I, I find this image very powerful, and in part because I know I've seen it many times, but and I, I'm also in your space, in the on the fifth floor where the exhibition is. I've I'm, I've been in that space, and there's a direct uh, connection between this image and that space, and. So what happens in the space here in the exhibition? How does it relate to this image and then to the other objects that are included in that space? Um, well, uh, this, this, for example, this meeting uh, had, had a, a very significant moment, no? In this meeting, Robinson Rosado, he, uh, he shared with us uh, a ceremonial Spatula for the cohova, no, for the co and a cohova spatula. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it was very important, no, when when regarding the tree, Amanari, for example, in red, he he meant he referred to the tree and that within an indigenous system of belief as as a as a teacher, no, 
So that was an inf a significant moment in that discussion. Uh, we, for example, I uh, presented the work in recognition of, of, uh, of the Chévere's family, no? regarding well, the discussion that was present within uh, the, the, the design discussion or, or uh, recognizing a spirit behind this, this loose way in which we could carry on, no? uh, we could gather within that Chévere spirit, which is a word in Spanish that, uh, that translates to, to cool. So that was uh, something that was uh, developing conversations with Pablo Leon de la Barra, uh, a curator that, that gave me the, the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to develop this commission. Uh, so, and Robinson Rosado provided you know, the handing of this material. So this is the first time that we collectively manage a cultural object in recognition of the place that we were uh, coming together. So this was a very important uh, meeting and, and, and we are putting forth a space as so within an area of the installation. So, um, so uh, I, I just wanted to, to recognize this as, as, uh, as a very important you know, image. And uh, so and other elements of the installation uh, as, uh, as those works that, are, that I see as uh, how have I carried on those collaborations with crafters in the island, no? Uh, and for example, here we see uh, Guadalupe Villalobos, uh, who, who, whom, with whom I underwent a process of learning his, his trade, no? Uh, his furniture, making process, no? which is, which is uh, woodworking and the weaving of an air, which is a plant that I've come to, to organize myself no? in my, my workspace. I've defined this plant as, 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 my, as, as, the cent as a central like, plant of my, of my practice. So I'm, I'm grateful that, that that moment has happened and, and a recognition as so has happened working with crafters in the island, no? For example, I remember one, a first craft that I approached in this, uh, in this like, design consideration, no? Uh, was basketry, no? And was basketry through one crafter, uh, where his, uh, Edwin Marcucci, from, from the town of Adjuntas in the south uh, part of, south central part of the island, uh, and and he and I and I referred to basketry, and it was very important to to think about a weaving, no, a, a weaving that provided a, a, a structure, no, and and also to undercarry in that process of sourcing the material and have and have the conscious that a person that sources its material, no, it's. It, uh, under carries many knowledges of the place that in which he in, in which he goes to no the, the, to 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 el monte we say in spanish no that doesn't translate easily to forest no uh, the person that goes to el monte is very knowledgeable about about uh, about the plants that he steps to so it i'm uh, thank you for today we're speaking about about plants plant uses so that was my my initial drive in this in this uh, in these considerations, no. So uh, it's very important that in this uh, this chair, this image, no. We are seeing that design that I mentioned, uh, Henry Klum's chair, uh, and it's interesting how uh, how this craft family took a template from this chair that was designed in the in between 1945 1947. When the when the, the firm of the architect no, was was actively producing in in Santurce, where I have a workshop, no? uh, so uh, so uh, a previous generation of from of, of Guadalupe took a template no of the of the chair and uh, and continue producing it, applying the, the the plant fiber that they work with, and uh, and the design. Continued, no. Even though that is that that design firm closed, the design continued and lived as as a popular 
chair. So one that you can find in craft fair. So I'm, I'm interested in that, in that way in which that, uh, that, author, that author piece of design becomes popular. No? Uh, and the material, the fiber, that's Enea. The fiber is Enea, yes. Uh, and he's one of, of the teachers that I've come to, to work with. It's important that, it, that, uh, that he lives close to, to, and in that same neighborhood, there's a, there's a significant cave no? in Ciales. This is in the town of Ciales. And there's a, a significant cave, mm -hmm. a very important cave that, I, that, I, that I've come to understand that it hasn't been academically uh, revised or studied. Mm -hmm. no? So uh, this person that I, that I mentioned before, Robinson Rosado, who is also from Ciales, who is a craft promoter, no? and he, relate, he, he, he regards himself as an, uh, an archaeology aficionado. No? Uh, so uh, he, he's closely related to crafts no? in Puerto Rico. He, comes, he extends himself from a, from a first generation of, of, of people who circulated the island, no? identifying, recognizing authorships behind the craft as an exercise to, for, for the continuity, no? so people could refer to a maker, no? mm -hmm. have a name and refer to a practice and a maker. Uh, so uh, Robinson Rosal comes from, from, from to working with uh, Walter Murechiesa, who was that first person who gave authorship to the crafts of the island. And, uh, and, and also he is the first person that, that, that commented to me that crafts relate to an indigenous past. No? Mm -hmm. And I come, some come to regard that, that there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a point that signifies for me modernity, which is the period of contact, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, for that consideration, no? Since it, it, uh, it brings to, to, uh, to a, a, in a philosophical sense, it brings together an indigenous past, no? It, it brings to, it bridges, no? That consideration of modernity bridges the indigenous, no? Bridges the, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, there's a, so this plant is also carried on, no? With, within another craft tradition of the island, but I want to also come back to the idea of, 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 this, of this cave, no? Mm -hmm. And this, uh, which also, that image of, of the cave is very much present in the, in the installation, no? Do you want to go to the better roof one? Or the next, I, that, that one? And so, yes, this regards very close to, to, that, to the cave, no? Image. Uh, we have one of the zigzag structure. And that, but, uh, So um, here we come. It's so uh, to the, there's a an an a cave image very much present now that that we've come to to this uh, to this and uh, and the title and the title of of the installation which is uh, Ayacabo Guarocoel uh, takes uh, takes reference from uh, a passage, no, a chapter from. The, the chronicle of Fray Ramon Pané, uh, which, uh, which I, I would like to just later on uh, just hear your, your thoughts no, on, uh, on that text as, uh, as, as that resource in which uh, uh, Taino beliefs have been used, no, as, as Taino beliefs have been uh, well, consulted no, through, this, through this text. No? So uh, the, the Chronic of Pané, which, is, uh, which has been regarded as a first uh, eth ethnographical treaty, uh, it has also been regarded as a text that opens uh, the, the letters of America, uh, which happened in 1994, when, in 1494. Uh, so, uh, um, this friar you know, uh, collected the stories of the Taino in the eastern side of of, of La Española, you know? and uh, and I am uh, so uh, 
So in it, there are registers of indigenous voices, no? Uh, there are the passings also. There are, there are, that, that is the source in which, uh, uh, in which well, Taino sacred stories has been, have, been, have been collected, no? Uh, and this, uh, and, and there's a passage in which, uh, in which, uh, there's a, a, a phrase, no? The, the, there's a, a collection of a phrase which is Ayacabo uh, Guarocoel, which is the recognition of, of the ancestors, no? The, the phrase translates to "Let's meet our grandfather." So, uh, so in, so within that that chapter, there is the, there is the. The meeting of the four mythological brothers that uh, that appeared to the grandfather, uh, wanting to know about the the cassava, the cassava bread, uh, and the cohoba conforms part of that of, the, of 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 that meeting, no? And it's that violent moment in which the the brother the Minam Caracaracol, which Jorge. Well, presented that has uh, accompanied him through the years at the institution at, uh, at the Smithsonian. Um, so, uh, so, and from from that meeting between the grandfather and the and the mythological brothers, no, that uh, the the presenting of the casabe and the cohova, no, become present. Also, the the image of the cave becomes uh, becomes present. That image of the cave in which uh, in which the cave in which the sun and the moon are born, mm -hmm. and from it, uh, and and within this cave, uh, there are two there are two two objects, two semis, no, that are present there that are that are to be consulted when there when it is necessary to 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 attain a better uh, climatic. Uh, uh, moment, no. So uh, it is interesting that that it is uh, uh, of of great significance that in this place we are to 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 have, no. In this installation, we are to have uh, a sacred object that 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 goes into a representation of the of 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 this uh, spiritual, no, uh, uh, forces, no. The, which are the, those twins with, that are part of, of of the communal area of the installation. There's one that regards the putting forth this support structure, uh, which has present the, those uh, materials, you know, that uh, which have become part of of my practice, you no. Know? So, uh, do you want to say something about the what happens and, and actually what's happening here in this image um, and how it relates to your practice of inviting people to what is the goal of that and also of, of having those voices there in that space? Um, so uh, we have the opportunity to 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 read out loud in this space, no? To to have. Uh, to invite people to activate the space by by way of readings, no? um, and reading have, has been an element that has been referred to. No, as I mentioned, we had this reading uh, below the canopy of of, of the Cohoba, the University of Puerto Rico, and also it is a reference to to uh, to a way in which. For example, tobacco rollers uh, it, uh, organize themselves uh, an education by assigning a reader among among the, themselves, uh, and this was a, an element that has been incorporated into the into the into into conceiving into sharing you no know, those craft elements that are part of 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 a learning process of so. Uh, so this is a place where we where we have gathered two well we have gathered me, different objects no uh, different cultural objects I, this this area of the installation has come to to bring together different loans from different institutions uh, in Puerto Rico and New York I mentioned the the uh, the twins uh, amulet no 
and there's also uh, a calendar piece, uh, which is uh, which is a body stamp that has been interpreted by uh, by a, a historian in Puerto Rico as a, as a calendar. No, so uh, so it is. Uh, if, if you see that that piece to your it would be to your right. Uh, that small piece to your. You can point with the thing. Um, so those, uh, for example, that calendar piece, which was, uh, which was a, a, a work that I referred to when, uh, when we were thinking about, uh, the, in the installation, you know, when Marcela approached, approached me with the interest in developing an installation, we regarded the, this uh, installation developed in Puerto Rico at, uh, at Embajada uh, last year when we, when we referred to, to how this piece uh, when interpreted, no? interpreted by this historian, Pedro Escavi, referred to it as a, as a calendar. This, uh, the inscriptions, the lines and points and dots that are organized within this piece there is no escape then that within them there is a there there is a representations of 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 days and months and those are 359 days within 19 months mm -hmm. so through that consideration uh, uh, we as, we assign ourselves no uh, a calendar as other cultures assigned have referred to an indigenous past and that indigenous past has their own calendar. We, uh, as, as culture in, in, in the Antilles, we have a calendar, no? A calendar that, that uh, and also it's interesting how his work no, provided the complexity of an indigenous thought. And that has been a very, um, a, an important no? practice, no? Mm -hmm. Through other elements that, did his, that this historian has engaged, no? In, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, in, the, his has been the basis in which uh, a native community of researchers have felt no the need to 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 communicate no from outside the the, uh, the academical space. So uh, in having the opportunity to to work within this institution uh, have have given me the tools to to refer to other institutions no that uh, the that have been part of the discussion. For example, this, this, uh, this piece uh, uh, it's, uh, is at the, it, is, it comes from the University of, of Puerto Rico, the Museum of uh, History, Anthropology, and Art. Uh, so uh, so uh, to, to, have an, to have this example as well as, as we have, you know, we also have uh, uh, fragments of, of Burenes, no? Mm -hmm. Jorge, I wanted to make a question. I want to open it to the public because um, I'm sure they have questions. But um, as a way of maybe finalizing the conversation, one thing that uh, seems to me that it's recurrent in the three presentations that we heard today and that you and I have talked about, especially of what's happening in your space, is the, this idea of passing knowledge and passing knowledge also as a way of translation or vice versa, the translation that happens in many of the elements like the monotypes, for example, of um, taking one form to whether it's from the oral to the written, for example, or from the actual petroglyphs in um, certain parts of Puerto Rico to these monotype. Uh, can you say a little bit, of, talk a little bit about that translation that goes and that it's very much in, in, at the root of your uh, space? Because even um, the Fray Ramon Panes text um, is something that is today with us through many iterations, through many translations. And then after that, maybe we can open in it to, to the audience. So uh, I'm... I'm interested, for, for example, what, uh, what we have, what I've come to know from both uh, 
Jorge and Jose, is that they put forth those, uh, those living elements that are present within Taino culture. Uh, I've come to refer to this text, no? which at times it is that reference that in which we, could, uh, we, could, we can identify uh, cultural objects, but also to refer to, to our territory no? in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, all, and, uh, and within those considerations, I'm to, to, to say that, uh, that, that that process had, has, 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 uh, has been an enriching one, having the opportunity to work with people who, who sustain uh, a native, you know, uh, consideration of the, I can, a native space to conform the discussions of their mm -hmm. uh, cultural bienes uh, culturales, no? Mm -hmm. Cultural goods. Cultural goods. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so the installation, the, the work, no? That, uh, uh, so takes upon that that mode, no, that uh, that that support in bringing in bringing an, uh, a communal space within an institution and bring together these cultural goods uh, in order to conform a discussion, to conform a space in which one can mediate within those elements and also bring together interpretations no? mm -hmm. within them, uh, within, that inclusive, in, within that inclusive manner that, uh, that I see present in, in the researches, no? in Taino research, for example, no? mm -hmm. in, in Taino survival, or right. legacies. So. Great, thanks. So right. maybe now we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I think we have some microphones to those sides. Thank you. I, I was really fascinated because I knew nothing about uh, Tiana culture before this evening, and thank you for presenting this to me. I wanted to ask, are there any vestiges of Tiana musical culture? And if you could speak to that, thank you. Um, to anyone? Um, <clears throat> well, um, I think that... Uh, in the Dominican Republic, at least, we have um, a, f a couple of dances and a couple of songs that, that are definitely uh, of, um, of Taino extraction. In, um, in the area called Samana, there is a, uh, a dance um, that's also accompanied with song that's called Carayan. And this dance is done um, during a full moon. Now, in the Taino language, Caraya means moon. So that kind of tells you where the origin of that is, right? And um, this dance is performed when they're, whenever they're planting crops that must be, um, that must be um, planted during a full moon. So that's one. And then we also have uh, about three or four yucca dances. Um, these dances and the songs that go along with them, uh, although in Spanish, but the beats that are, that, are, that are played are done on a pentatonic music scale. So um, most of the African, um, songs and dances are, are performed on a, a heptatonic, which is like seven or eight beats, but the, the ones that are Taino are, are, are on four beats, four to five beats. So we have uh, those yuga dances. In Haiti, there's a, a, there's a dance that's called the kuyaya, which in the Taino language means um, uh, kestrel or sparrowhawk. Um, I have not seen that one um, myself, so I can't really verify what it is or not. But, um, and then also in the, in the southern part of the Dominican Republic, there's the hakana, which is also another indigenous word. And this is a, a, a solstice, a summer solstice uh, song, song and dance. Um, uh, in Cuba, there's, there's some too, but I think Jose could probably um, speak to you about that better than I can. Um, well, there, there are, um, there's a strong singing tradition in the agricultural work still. I say people work the fields <clears throat> and uh, they're in Spanish largely. But um, the songs uh, clearly refer to uh, <clears throat> natural world uh, elements. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a 
it's kind of a signal song that they uh, start a lot of ceremonies with. And uh, <coughs> it goes, uh, Yo trabajo con la luna, yo trabajo con el sol, sol y luna, préstame tu resplendor. So it's the idea of, I work with the moon, I work with the sun, sun and moon, uh, lend me your splendor, your brightness. Um, and and uh, any number of other um, uh, uh, traditions that uh, converge in a style of the mountains called Changui, which is, it travels all over, but when you find it in the, in the origin place of it, there's a lot of Changwis that have natural world mm -hmm. um, elements. And there's a beat, it's a, mm. it's a three step beat that I've only seen up there. And a little dance that gets performed as well that, uh, that uh, is clearly an Indian step. But I know my, uh, uh, my work, I've decided to concentrate getting away from the, um, the notion of what is and what was and what goes back to Taino. Um, although that's, always, that's, a, that's a fine quest to have. But more, um, what are the people of the descendant community, Indian community, like today? What do they do? I'm not proving anything. How do they do their cropping? How do they deal with their animals? How do they think about the natural elements? What's their prayer tell you, which is completely non-Christian uh, uh, prayers? Uh, the, the healing traditions especially are so pronounced and so full of that connective tissue, you know, with, with the sacred that um, I think uh, that's, a, that's a, a big piece of it. What's alive of that... Um, that notion of indigeneity. I like to land on indigeneity because I always tell people, I'm not here to certify Indians. <laughs> I'm not here to, to say this is an Indian, this is not an Indian. I don't care about that. I'm looking for indigeneity. And the values of indigeneity are the values of native people. World alive, what they call animism in, in anthropology. The, the, everything in this world is alive. This is the living world. Nothing belongs here that's not alive. Very indigenous notion. Appreciation for the elements of nature, second concept. It's in every ceremony across the Americas. There isn't a ceremony that doesn't express appreciation for the Mother Earth, or this and so forth going up in many different varieties of ways, but, but it, 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 it happens. Um, reciprocity between human beings, reciprocity today for you, tomorrow for me. We help each other. Reciprocity with the earth when they still do, and we all do. Leave something behind for that plant. You, you express a thanksgiving to that plant before you pick it, and you leave something behind of yours. Mm -hmm. that, that, that creates a relationship. That's there completely. Um, balance, equilibrium, duality. Duality, uh, the concept of duality, very deep in every indigenous tradition. And around that, those four elements or, or concepts, the thinking tradition that incorporates that. So that your philosophy, your sense of life, your sense of what is happening is not prism, you know, it's not the prism mm -hmm. of the West. It's a different prism. It's an indigeneity. Indigeneity it can be in a black face, it can be in a white face, it can be in a Chinese face, it can be in any face, because that's the one thing about the genetic trail that I like. What they're talking about is not what you look like or what you look like, it's what's inside you. Mm -hmm. And genetics in that way is kind of similar to culture, it's what's inside of you, it's what's inside of you. Sometimes they connect, even in a spiritual way, and we're finding even science is telling us that uh, that uh, you inherit, you, you inherit trauma, you inherit joyfulness, you know, you inherit those elements that become emotions. So this is, there's a wisdom in the indigenous. And as I'm really glad for these artists now that are starting to explore sacred space, the consciousness of the sacred, you know, and bringing it into an institution, which is not easy to do. Um, 
in order to open up some space, just like we're trying to open space for this indigeneity question. That's been our fight. Just open up that damn space. Mm -hmm. I love what Gandhi said. First, they ignore you. Then they ridicule you. Then they get angry at you. Then you win. <laughs> you know, and that's what's happened to our movement because we, we took a lot of guff in this movement oh, just man. for bringing oh, this question up. I'm surprised I, I ended up in the academy as how I did because I thought I was going to get thrown out a few times mm. just for mentioning this question. Mm. And so uh, in Cuba, I know in my dialogues with people there, the, the, the question of division was there. Yeah, you, is this going to divide our people? Some are, some aren't, some aren't. And it's the contrary. It's the unifying base. We're all Taino. Let's see if there. That's, that's what I like about it. Thanks, Jose. I think I have, a, there's a question, there's two questions, well, three, okay. Let's try to get <laughs> these three. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Oh. Then you, you'll go next, sorry. Okay, I wanted to ask about the uh, uh, Taino language. I know that there are several words that we don't come directly from the Taino, maybe a few phrases, but has anybody been able to like put together a conversation in Taino? Glory. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yes. <clears throat> there are, um, in the Taino community, there are several attempts um, uh, trying to revive the language. The fact is that the Spanish that is spoken across the Caribbean is inundated with Taino words. Um, and the more, the more deeper you go into the campo, the more, the more you hear these. Um, but the thing is, the problem is that uh, Taino spoke several dialects. So in trying to revive the language, you know, like a group over here will come up with some things and then we'll, they'll, they'll disagree with this group. So I think that um, eventually we will get it together because, you know, we actually do have programs that, that are um, in place now to develop um, the language again. But um, we're going to have Taino languages at the end of it. It's not going to be one, one thing, you know. Um, and I think that's natural because there was not one uh, Taino language per se. There were dialects spoken across the island. There was differences in, in many instances. And, and we find them now, you know. Um, you know, uh, is, the, is son gue or casi? Uh, in the Caribbean, we find both words, you know, and both of them mean son in other Arawakan languages. So that's a, that's, that's a little conundrum there to try to figure that out, you know. So, so maybe this group likes Kasi and this group likes Gue, and there's the, the polemic, you know, in the, the situation. Uh, something that can get really heated is the, the language debate. But, um, but people are uh, honestly and seriously looking into language. And, and I, I, I think in about another five, good five years, we'll have people speaking um, a fluent something, but, but, but definitely something is coming. For sure. It's been too modest. They've, they've organized quite a work, work group uh, on the languages. And uh, uh, they're uh, self-taught, largely, but uh, very conscious of linguistics and, and, and check in with linguists cons mm -hmm. consistently. So we're seeing something develop that uh, finally augurs for you know, some, some recovery of, of, of uh, uh, whether it will ever be a spoken language again. There's a lot of things in between. That, you know, now and then, but, but uh, the effort's being made, and it's not just to speak it, which is a wonderful goal, but to appreciate it. Language appreciation. This, is, this language issue is in every tribe in the, in the hemisphere. People are having that issue, and many times they start with the young people, so well, at least let's develop a, an appreciation of the language, the poetics of the language, the meanings of the words, uh, the relationship that, that uh, the grammar has. So it, it uh, it, it's just one more wonderful exploration of, of, of culture. Yeah, you, you remember, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but like, um, when I was young, I remember people used to, like Puerto Ricans would poke fun at Dominicans as to how they spoke and vice versa, <laughs> you know, and then both of us would make fun of the Cubans the way they spoke. <laughs> um, and uh, I used to hate that, you know, I used to hate the fact that, you know, like, like I'm from the Cibao and we speak on, Vamos a ver que se va a hacer, que se va a comer, de donde hay, you know, and, and that's the way we speak our Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. But I never appreciated that. And then once I started getting into the Taino language and I see where a lot of this, um, this comes from, I, now I appreciate it. I love to hear 
campesinos from Cuba speaking. I can hear Dominican in it now, you yeah. know, and, and, and vice versa. And, and if you are like in Lattes, um, Puerto Rico, you can hear mm -hmm. Cuban Spanish there somehow because you've got this, this Taino connection and, and that alone is, is beautiful. We have a question yeah. here and then a, another one over there. I want to make sure that we have time for both of them. Um, so thank you for this program the, and telling us about the, the Taino legacy and how it still exists and how it still survives. I am obsessed with censuses mm -hmm. and how they are taken and how uh, the methodology of it, um, the collection of it. So my question is um, to the panel, do the governments uh, in Puerto Rico, Cuba, La República Dominicana, how do they take the census? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how people are identifying because uh, we all know historically that there have been a lot of campaigns uh, funded by many governments to sort of have this erasure of language, of culture, of traditions. So can you speak a little bit about that? How when people take the census, how they identify? Because certainly, certainly you, we have the evidence of the DNA with each country. I'm not very well versed on census, but, but um, I don't believe the, the census in Cuba has uh, race. I, I could be wrong. Somebody might know better. Um, um, what I do know is that the families in the mountains are um, conducting a family count based on the genealogies of the lines. And um, it's quite high. It's up to about 8,000 right now. This is all, each with its own uh, form, you know, uh, person by person. Uh, it's being done by a group of museums in that area. Uh, also working with, with Casa de las Americas and uh, Antonio uh, Nunez Jimenez Foundation. So it's not a census in an official capacity, it's just the family wanting to know how many of us are there. And so they're doing, they're doing that one. So that's as, as, as much as I can respond to your question. I, I think in Puerto Rico, the census, um, Taino identity shot up Tremendously in the past, uh, in the past 15, 20 years, didn't it? So it went up from like like a few thousand to like 34,000 people across the island identifying Sikhi with Taino. So and it's growing every every day. It's growing a little more. How the governments are dealing with that, I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Well, uh, I've come to to know about uh, about the efforts of of uh, of a group that. Uh, that wants to be recognized by the government, and in that exercise, claim their their territory. So, uh, so yeah. that um, uh, so there are different communities, Taino communities within within the island. Uh, I've come to to work with with a family that claims that their Taino heritage, uh, and and a way of claiming that heritage is through through their pottery practice, so through through engaging in. To, that they engage in a process of relearning a lost technique. So uh, there are ways in which different groups relate to that claiming of the territory, but I know of a certain group that they want to be recognized as so. You know. yes. um, I'm interested in a little bit about the art and how you're communicating um, kind of a, a traditional form of, it, was, it came from the chair. So a traditional form of making the chair and the original architects that came up with the design of the chair um, and how you as an artist are communicating that translation to a more contemporary design or um, designed by someone else, but with that same blueprint. So I guess, how are you communicating that transition of the blueprint from one entity to another? Um, well, the, the, it was, there's a, a process of development. I'm interested in how this chair took from a vernacular form. And it's interesting how that chair, well, I, to extend that a little bit more, but come to an indigenous origin within that chair could be, could be a development from the Touré, which is, a, which is a campesino chair, a low sitting chair, which could refer to the Dujo, which is the indigenous seat that, that they referred to, uh, the seat of the cacique, of the beique, that ceremonial seat that survived through a campesino, you no. Know, furniture, piece of furniture. It's interesting how the campesino, how that campesino chair, it's called ture, which is an indigenous word that refers to 
to sky, no? So it's it, it, that modernist uh, type, no? Refer to our vernacular forms. That design process from this gen, from that generation of modernist architect that referred to, to our climatical context in their design process, no? That developed this concept of mo tropical modernity in Puerto Rico, which we have an example here. That development, uh, this this from uh, this meeting space that is referred to as a um, as a boio, which is also this vernacular the space or this uh, indigenous space word that refers to to the hut, to to the house, to the house in in cases that could be understood as a communal house also. Uh, these are some. These are things that have come to to gather, no, within references, but it's uh, uh, as in, within my practice that putting that chair into discussion, I'm interested in. For example, here we see that that same chair. To ah. <laughs> let me see. So we see that there's the chair and the modular possibilities of that chair could could be extended no we can we can provide from from the from the analysis of of the type and the uh, there are modular possibilities that could, could that could amount the collective for example that collective uh, so that conception of the collective within the consideration of the type so that is how i st that is how i put forth well uh, 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 a design process, a design conversation, which has the history of an indigenous, for me, has a, a, an indigenous references, reference, but putting forth that making with, with a crafter, with, with a family, because craft bring together a family, you know? So I'm, I'm lucky to have, to have come to that, to that meeting place to, to understand that craft traditions bring together families. Those are concepts that are present within indigeneity. So uh, that communal making. So, uh, so for example, we see that that design process brought brought together uh, wood making and uh, and also brought uh, uh, had uh, also referred to to um, to the material to to the cord to the cotton cord to the material in which hammocks are made. So uh, so I. Put forth no that conversation remaking no, making that chair together with a with a with a hammock maker no, and together we develop what is the stool the, that stool that has been a, a support of 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 meetings no, or with, which carry on that uh, that mobile spirit no, that's that uh, which 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 I have to refer to as. Escuela Oficios or trade school project, no? which is a symbolical space in which we are to, to put forth a conversation with, with a crafter or, or conceive these meeting spaces as we, we see here. No? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that's the end of our program. <laughs> I just looked at the phone. Thank you for um, everybody's time. And please go to the Taino exhibition at the NMAI, which opens on July 28th. On July 28th also, since you're going to be around, um, come to Jorge's. Uh, we're going to have a f the first of three performances or activations of the gallery. Um, that's on Saturday, July 28th at 6 p.m. So make it a museum day and come to the NMAI and the Whitney. Um, thank you, everyone. Come to the NMAI, ask for me, and you can get in for free. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a free museum. <laughs>